All right, ladies and gentlemen, a, uh, I'd like to say a funny thing has happened or a terrible thing has happened, but it's more of the same. In a despicable act, the President of the United States, then backed up by his spokesperson, then backed up by Jen Psaki of the State Department, have now claimed that the attack on the kosher market in Paris was just a random attack. In other words, it could have been, you know, uh, McDonald's. It could have been, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a Buddhist uh, a grocery store. Just happened to be a kosher. Uh, and this is disgusting. And kudos to Jennifer Rubin, columnist and author of the Right Turn blog at the Washington Post for writing about it today. Hello, Jennifer. Hi, how are you? You know, the rationale that these people weren't targeted by name, well, when are they by terrorists at the World Trade Center? Uh, if they break into a synagogue or a mosque or a church, when, when are they targeted by name? You know, what is so despicable, and I think you're right, it, it really is, is that for two years now, Jews in Europe have been under siege, um, primarily because of Islamic terrorists at schools, at synagogues, uh, graffiti, physical attacks, murders. And the president uh, chooses not to see that. He chooses not to see the video of the jihadist himself explaining what he was up to and instead wants to pass this off as some kind of random, you know, workplace violence is what he called the Fort Hood uh, attack. He goes out of his way to ignore it because he doesn't want to deal with the problem, which he won't name, which is Islamic jihad or Islamic fundamentalism. Um, it, it is a very sorry, sorry day. And unfortunately, one is forced to recall that there's a long tradition in Europe about denying the persecution of Jews. And that comes primarily from right wing, but also left wing parties that are anti Jewish. Um, and it is a very, very despicable past. The president has given it some currency today, and that is a shame. Now, within the last few minutes, his uh, State Department spokesman and I believe even his White House spokesman have tried to walk this back. But I think we've seen exactly how they feel. They're reacting to the Twitter outrage, not to uh, any kind of uh, real feelings that the president might, may have about the subject. Right. It is. And when you take it in combination with uh, his relationship with Netanyahu and uh, what's going on with uh, Iran and, you know, the biggest threat to peace being an Israeli construction worker and a boss is a man of peace. It just is very, very troubling. Let's talk about another piece that you wrote today, how the Iran deadline is not really a deadline. And I think that's uh, that's a great point. Right. The administration had promised that by the end of March, there would be a political framework agreement. No one's really sure what that meant, but one can suspect it's sort of an outline of what the final, final deal would be. And you'll remember that's not due until a year after it was already promised. Well, the supreme leader in Iran piped up the other day and said he wasn't really in favor of uh, this political framework. We should just do a deal and be done with it. So wouldn't you know, yesterday the administration starts backing up and saying, well, we're not going to really need a political framework. Maybe it won't be in writing. Um, you know, whatever the Iranians bark at them, the administration says how high, whether it's a deadline, whether it's the substance of the talks, and it just gives everyone the notion, particularly the Iranians, that these people can be played. Um, they can be stalled. They can give away the store. All the Iranians have to do is keep saying no, 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 no. And the administration capitulates. And I think that's where we're headed, either to another no deal. That's probably the best case scenario. Um, the worst case right. scenario is an awful deal, which in essence puts the stamp of approval on Iran's nuclear uh, weapons capability. Going uh, domestically for a second here, and another piece you wrote at uh, the uh, Right Turn blog at the Washington Post, Marco Rubio's moment with a question mark. You talk about, you know, the exit of, uh, of uh, um, uh, Romney and uh, the Christie uh, stumbling out of the gate. Now the investigation into Christie by the feds and, uh, you know, and, and Bush. Notwithstanding, you say that uh, he hasn't knocked Rubio out, as many predicted his, his candidacy would, although he hasn't announced. Uh, it, can Marco Rubio rise here? You know, it's um, for a while I didn't think so. But, you know, if you ignore the state familiarity and after all, we'll have multiple candidates from Texas. There's no rule that says two people from the state can't run for president uh, against one another. There is a distinction. Obviously, he's a different person than Jeb Bush. 
Um, he doesn't have the Jeb Bush fatigue issue. He is of the next generation. He has different experience, both in the State House and in Congress. He's been fighting these battles recently against Obamacare, against the president's foreign policy, um, certainly. So he might as well take a shot at it. He didn't strike me as someone who was all that anxious to become a lifetime member of the United States Senate. Um, right. And the worst right. he might do I is agree. someone would pick him for vice president. Um, he does have That's a uh, good point. Uh, the requisite knowledge. Uh, uh, the question is whether he- Yeah, uh, you know, a governor, uh, Jennifer, I got to go, but a governor adding the gravitas of foreign policy with him would be a great pick. Thank you, Jennifer Rubin, as always. We're coming back with Michael Rubin. Don't go away.